Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Samuel Reynolds, and I'm the Chief Medical Resident at the University of Louisville for Education. I'd like to speak to you today for a few minutes about the introduction to abstract writing for clinical vignettes specifically. Now, before I begin, I want to give credit to where it's due to Ms. Vida Vaughn. She is our staff librarian and is responsible for a lot of the content in this talk as well. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's start with the basics. What is an abstract? Well, an abstract is a concise statement of the major elements of your research project. Now, that can include a case. It simply states the purpose of your research or introduction of the case that you'll be talking about, the methods, if they apply, and, of course, the case presentation and discussion section. In a sense, this is a condensed version of a full scientific paper, or it's a simple case presentation that has added to it a discussion section in sort of a review of the available literature. So that's what I want you to sort of internalize while watching this talk. So why are abstracts important? Well, they're required for submission to most major conferences and for poster presentations, either locally or on the national level. They're also important because they're required as part of submission if you are publishing a case report or a case series. They're also used for longitudinal research. I think most importantly for residents and for medical students, abstracts are very useful in knowing how to do them because they allow you to practice in communicating scientific information in a precise manner. Now, before I move any further, I just want everyone to be aware that abstracts specifically for research are not going to be discussed in this presentation. It's just for clinical vignette and for case-based work. So let's get started. First and foremost, speaking of which, let's identify the project type. In this presentation, we're going to speak about clinical vignettes, for example, for a poster. You might also look at doing an abstract for a case report or a case series, or for longitudinal research, retrospective study. Now, how are these different? Well, for a clinical vignette or for a poster, you pretty much start with the abstract, whereas for longitudinal research, you finish your entire study, you publish the results or get ready to publish them, and then you go back and finish your abstract, which summarizes your findings. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but just understand that abstracts serve a different function in the clinical vignette settings for a case presentation, for a conference, example, for a poster, than they do in the longitudinal research form. So the first thing you have to do is begin your background research and really identify what topic do you want to present on. The best way to do that is either to be a doctor in the hospital and be seeing patients with unique conditions that present with teaching points, or to go into the available literature, which PubMed.gov is a great resource, but it's affiliated with the NIH. They'll specifically give you an idea of where the gaps are in the available literature. So what I would suggest if you're doing longitudinal research and you're forming a research question that's driven by population intervention control outcome, begin with PubMed.gov. However, if you are beginning on the clinical vignette side, really start on the inpatient side of things. The four C's of abstract writing. Now, these are very important. An abstract writing should, uh, process rather should be complete. It should cover the major parts of a project or a case. It should be concise, containing no excess wordiness or unnecessary information. It should be very clear. It needs to be readable. You know, your reader has to interpret what you're doing. And don't include too much medical jargon because you never know who your reviewer is. An abstract should also be cohesive and flow smoothly between the parts. So what are the major characteristics of abstract writing? Well, abstracts should be first and foremost complete. They should cover the major parts of a project or case. They should also be very concise, containing no excess wordiness or unnecessary information. Now, these first two are very, very important because if your abstract has covered all the available information in the literature, well, that's tremendous. But if it's not concise, people won't want to read it and they won't be able to understand the main points you're trying to communicate. So really commit those to memory. And that's not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of practice. The next important thing is that it's clear. And this is where your language becomes very important. Your abstract has to be something readable. Even if you go into PubMed, the most complex research studies have very clear messages. You don't want too much medical jargon, but you want just enough detail to where an experienced practitioner can look at your abstract and have an exact idea of what's going on with your study. Last and perhaps most importantly, your abstract has to be cohesive and flow smoothly between the parts. What I mean by this is it has to be a separate introduction case presentation and discussion section, but they have to come together in a way where somebody who's never heard of your research can understand what it is you're trying to present on. 
a little bit of a note on writing. We won't spend too much time on this, but you really need to avoid the passive voice. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's take a sentence. Program evaluation will be performed through objective measures. If we want to rework this to make the sentence a little stronger, you would say we will use objective measures for program evaluation. Let's take a second example. Now, I'm going to give you more of a case example here in a minute, but let's take the sentence. Authors would later identify a trend towards thrombocytopenia in patients with HIV. You can reword that to patients with HIV presented with thrombocytopenia as identified by authors. So you see how you take the subject and really orient it so it's at the beginning of the sentence and then the object of whatever you're presenting is towards the end of the sentence. That's how you really strengthen your sentence and make your language a little bit more convincing. So now that we've gone over a little of the point behind an abstract, a little of the finer points and what you're trying to get across, let's talk about how you actually do the writing. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want you to be aware, again, this is not a research-driven abstract we're talking about. That will be a separate lecture. This is just for clinical vignettes. So let's start with your introduction. Your introduction section should be one to two brief sentences on the main topic you're talking about. There should not be a specific reference to your study or to the case. The case really should come in the next section. And if you have another study you want to talk about, that's for the discussion section. Again, you are just trying to bring people in to read through the rest of your abstract. Don't get too detailed here. So let's start with the introduction section of your case report. This should consist of no more than two sentences. Your first sentence should focus on the disease or subject area that you are referring to in your case. So let's just say that your case is going to discuss heart failure. Your first sentence should allude to that. The second sentence is where your case takes a unique personality within the available literature. Let's do an example. Let's say I have the following sentence. ITP is often linked to human immunodeficiency virus. But perhaps less well-known to providers is that HIV directly infects megakaryocytes through receptor CXCR4. This is a known sentence. My second sentence is where I'm taking a unique angle. Providers should accordingly be cautious in prematurely treating ITP, meaning idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, in HIV-infected patients with either steroids or immunoglobulin, as platelet values will likely demonstrate a stronger response to antiretroviral therapy. This is our unique aspect. So that's our entire introduction section. That's all you need. Let's talk about the case summary. The first thing you wanna do in your case summary, and keep in mind, this is a very concise way to present your patient, is start with a history and physical exam. Do two to four sentences summarizing the basic clinical history and exam, and only report on what's relevant to the final points you'll be talking about. We don't need to know an entire comprehensive metabolic panel or the patient's glucose values over 24 hours, of course, unless they're relevant. We really just need what's going to help teach your readers and highlight the main aspects of your case. Some tips here. Use the notes that you find in the electronic medical record. You know, use your clinic note. Do not forget vital signs. They are very often relevant and almost always are the first thing we see when we see a patient. So don't forget the basics. These can really help make your case relatable to readers. Next, I'd like to see you do the basic diagnostic studies. This should be one to two sentences where you summarize pertinent, normal, or abnormal findings. A couple of tips here on what you should include. And again, this is just the basics. A comprehensive metabolic panel, a complete blood count, or a PTINR or COAGS, only include what's pertinent, either in the positive direction or negative. An EKG, if it applies to your case, and even plain films, such as a chest radiograph. These will help characterize what your patient was looking like when you first saw him or her, and it will help frame what comes next. This is just one quick reminder that you only want pertinent values. Again, PMP. CBC, and INR. Only include EKG and chest radiographs if they apply to your case. Then spend one to two sentences summarizing everything that you've learned in these sections. So if the patient had a acute renal failure and they've had a certain amount of urine output and the chest radiograph showed worsening bilateral infiltrates, this is where that belongs. And it's all leading up to your advanced studies. 
This should be two to three sentences on the advanced studies that led to the ultimate diagnosis or disease understanding in your case. This is where you want to include the studies like CT, MRI, PET scans, even procedures or biopsies if they were performed. Now, I want to caution you here. You do not need advanced studies if your teaching point in the case is not that advanced studies are required. In fact, many of the best case reports you'll read emphasize testing that provides a very high level of patient care at a very low cost to our healthcare system. So you do not need these. However, if you have them available, or if these will be highlighted in imaging in your case report or poster presentation, we do need to hear about them in the abstract. With that, you can conclude the eventual diagnosis of your patient because often the advanced studies are what leads to a diagnosis. For example, if you, if you had a patient presenting with unintentional weight loss, obstructive jaundice, it's a good bet that there's some kind of mass in the hepatobiliary system. And that's often found through a procedure, either through an endo endoscopic ultrasound or a CT. So you should lead up to these, but you do not need them. Let's talk about the most important part of your case, your discussion section. This is what your case brings to the literature. This is the most significant portion because you're going to communicate to your reader why your research is significant. A couple of tips here. If the word count in your abstract is too high, and every conference is different here, take away from this section last because you don't, you don't want to lose your take home points. Reference at least two studies. So let's start with how you write it. Well, reflect that to the first sentence in your introduction. So here's a reminder of what our first sentence was. Here's how you sort of rework that. HIV infects megakaryocytes through agonism of CXCR4, leading to breakdown of these platelet precursors and production-based rhombocytopenia. You're not copy and pasting your introductory sentence, but you're reframing it to where you're going to be talking about the relevant literature. After you've introduced your discussion, let's introduce what your case brings here. The way you do this is to begin with a short statement, and this must be an organic thought that comes from you and then follow up with a study that's kind of related to it, utilizing your resources. PubMed and Dynamed are excellent resources. They contain evidence-based data and guidelines. Up-to-date is a misnomer because it's rarely up-to-date. In fact, it's based on expert opinion. However, the reference section will contain links to the most relevant studies. So you use the reference section only in up-to-date, but this is where you get your information from. This is kind of a busy slide, so I'll highlight what's important. This is um, one of the abstracts that I think really highlights this well. They're talking in the first sentence in red, you're speaking a little about how lymphoid cells in graft following uh, HSCT. Then it's getting immediately into a related study that's shown in black here. They're talking about how the study was relevant to your presented topic and then where your topic differs. Speaking of which, let's look at the last sentence in red. It is also worth noting that these studies while informative, do not comment specifically on the initial engraftment of these cells. So see how you've framed your discussion section? You've immediately talked about a related study, but then you've concluded with a unique angle of your case. This is what you want in your abstract. This is what people are going to look at because you're not publishing something that's already been commented on by another author or by another research group. You're offering your own ideas to the literature. So it's very, very important that you judiciously look in the literature and then make your own organic thought. How do you wrap up the discussion section once you've done this twice? Again, I'd like to see you do two studies. Well, reflect back to your introduction's second sentence. In our introduction, it was this. Providers should accordingly be cautious in prematurely treating ITP in HIV-infected patients with either steroids or immunoglobulin, as platelet values will likely demonstrate a stronger response to antiretroviral therapy. The conclusion sentence of your discussion section will reflect back and be related to the second sentence of your introduction section. Let's look at what we did here. Patients with HIV and chronically low platelet values should not be designated as having ITP, but rather treated as HIV-induced thrombocytopenia with antiretroviral treatment as the mainstay of therapy. You see how we're using very active words to provide meaningful take-home points to our listeners? That's very, very important here. So 
let's wrap things up. The next steps. Well, identify a conference or journal. If you're doing a clinical vignette or a case-based abstract, it's a little tougher to get these published. However, there are many, many conferences, especially in the internal medicine realm, that are accepting case-based research. The American College of Physicians National Conference not only has local meetings, but national meetings as well every year. So these are very, very good options. A couple tips. First of all, practice, practice, practice write your abstract, have a friend or a faculty member look over it, and don't be discouraged. You may not get in to your first try at your top choice journal, but an abstract, if you believe that it teaches something and adds something to science into the scientific literature, is meaningful and it's something we all want to hear. So don't be discouraged if you don't get accepted right away. Thank you for your time.